In this lecture, we're going to take a look at progress for women. There are plenty of women who are now working and they see a lot of problems in society and like many of the progressives, they want to fix them. One of the problems that they see that they want to address is child labor. Remember that companies are choosing to hire kids because you can pay kids less money than you would pay an adult and also their small hands fit really easily into the machines and they can do things that an adult cannot do. So while women are saying they would like to see progress, one of the things that they want to see progress in is getting rid of child labor. Unions are kind of teaming up with women here because they don't like when kids are hired. Their argument is that it lowers wages for all workers, including adults. Your boss can now say to you as an adult, you're going to take less money or we can hire a kid to do your job. So child labor is something that women would like to see or they're at least pushing for there to be some more severe limits on it. Another area where women are getting a bit more involved is in their own workforce. Uh, there are plenty of uh, women workers in the late 18 and early 1900s, much more than you saw even 50 years before. And remember that women are also paid less than men. And the assumption was, the reason why, is that women were only supporting themselves. They were not expected to support a family like a man was. So the idea is women's salary is simply adding on to what the man is already earning for the family. As the industrial age is bringing a lot of new jobs to America, some of the jobs that are opening up are jobs that demand better education. You need to, if you're going to be a secretary for someone like Rockefeller, you need to be a much more educated person than what we've had in the past. So you begin to see more women going on to high school. And that reason is because there are new jobs in offices and stores and classrooms that require it. And as more and more women are now going to high school, they begin to see that maybe college is an option. Colleges had been closed to women. So you begin to see some colleges open up that are specifically for women. They don't accept men. It is a female-only college. Vassar is an example. Smith College is another um, college that is set up just for women. And as more and more women are now going first to high school and now to college, the question then becomes, what do you do with your diploma? You couldn't, it was difficult for women to get a job. It simply wasn't done really. So what else do you do? You've got this diploma, now what? And a lot of women begin to get involved in the progressive movement. And they're getting involved because they see that this is an opportunity for them to begin changing the society that they're living in. They can actually get a job. They could maybe wear pants in public. They could vote. They could get divorced if they wanted to. But in order to do those sorts of things, they need to get involved with changing society. And what is it that they really want? What the women of the progressive age really are looking for is going to be an amendment that's equivalent to the 15th Amendment. Remember that the um, 15th Amendment is the one that said states cannot deny someone the right to vote because of uh, race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Essentially, you can't hold the fact that someone used to be a slave or the fact that someone is black that cannot be held against them and used as a reason for why they cannot vote. So then the question is, well, what about women? Women want an, uh, an amendment that will do the same thing. And they begin taking a look at, you know, women can be a mayor or a nurse or a doctor and not have the right to vote. However, look at the men who are allowed to vote. We've got convicts or lunatics or drunkards who are able to vote and yet women cannot. So that is something that the progressive women want. Let's get an amendment to the Constitution. Because if you don't have the right to vote, realistically, your ability to change the government is going to be severely limited. Politicians will listen to the people who can vote and the people who do vote. Women cannot vote at all. So that is something that people need to have change if women are going to be more influential in society. There are plenty of women who do not support women getting suffrage, which remember, suffrage is the right to vote. 
and those people are your anti-suffragists. The anti-suffragists have a lot of different reasons and a lot of different kinds of supporters. One supporter of the anti-suffrage movement or the movement to say women cannot vote is the liquor industry. And the reason why that is, is because many women support prohibition. Remember that prohibition is taking that temperance movement, but taking it a step farther. And they are saying, we would like the government to ban alcohol completely. In the 1800s and prior, women were kind of at the mercy of their husbands or fathers and how much they drank, how much of the uh, paycheck actually went to a bar instead of coming to the family. So women have been pushing to ban alcohol because they see the detrimental effects alcohol has on families. The liquor industry wants to ban or does not support women voting because they know that women will support banning alcohol. Secondly, the textile industry, which is right here, the cloth industry. And the reason a lot of the people in the, or the owners of the textile businesses are anti-suffrage for women is because women are hoping to get rid of child labor. And that is a huge money saver for a lot of businesses. So textile industries do not support women getting the right to vote because they know that women are going to then be voting for politicians who would restrict child labor. Lastly, there are just some men and some women who do not support women getting the right to vote. And the biggest reason why is because people fear change. And this is going to be a huge change for society. You're really changing the role of women, and that is something that makes people quite nervous. So now let's take a look at the people who are supporting suffrage and who exactly the leaders are in this movement. One of the biggest people who's leading this movement is this woman you see right here. Her name is Carrie Chapman Catt, and she's leading a group known as NASA, or the National American Woman Suffrage Association. Carrie Chapman Catt, you can see I've pictured here with Booker T. Washington, because I believe there are some similarities between the two of them. They both are going to be much more cautious and slow and steady in their approach to achieving their goal. Booker T. Washington wanted to see progress for black Americans. Carrie Chapman Catt wants the same thing for women. However, their attitude very much is be careful, support the politicians because those are the people who make the rules. And if they don't like you, they are not going to work with you. So Carrie Chapman Catt is very careful. One of the things that she does is she is pushing for a state by state strategy. There are states that do let women vote. It is a state's decision as to who is allowed to vote and who they deny suffrage. And she is pushing one state after another after another to allow this. President Woodrow Wilson, she believes that as the president of the nation, you must support him even if he doesn't support you and you will eventually win him over. She also believes in always acting like a lady. Don't embarrass the movement, don't give people a reason to criticize you, which was very much the idea that Booker T. Washington had. And obviously, just like not everyone agreed with Booker T. Washington, not everyone is going to agree with Carrie Chapman Catt. The person who disagrees with her most and is going to lead her own group of women uh, trying to gain suffrage is Alice Paul, who you see right here. And she is very similar to W.B. Du Bois because she is someone who wants suffrage to happen now. And like Du Bois wanted change to happen now and didn't really see that being nice and working with the government was getting you closer to your goal. Uh, Alice Paul believes in not doing state by state because states can then change their rules again later. She believes in amending that constitution. Just like there was the 15th Amendment, that's what she is strongly pushing for. It doesn't mean that Carrie Chapman Catt is against that. It just means that she thinks the smarter way to achieve the goal is a different way. Alice Paul wants an amendment to the Constitution. She believes that you don't support the president if he won't support suffrage. Why would you offer support to someone who is not supporting you? She's also willing to be unladylike, you know, push some boundaries and make people uncomfortable. She will heckle politicians. She will pick at the White House. And that's what you see right here. 
Mr. President, it says on their sign, how long must women wait for liberty? Alice Paul and the National Women's Party pickets the White House, and here they are in 1917, standing outside day after day after day, just letting their message be heard that women do not have the right to vote, and it's time for that to change. This is something that doesn't go over well with a lot of people in the United States, including President Wilson, but he does eventually change his tune, and you see that the president then does get on board supporting amending the Constitution. While the president has nothing to do with actually changing the Constitution, it is that support that he offers. That's really what President Woodrow Wilson is going to bring here. And eventually, it does happen. The 19th Amendment to the Constitution is the one that says you cannot deny someone the right to vote because of their gender. Women's suffrage now means that more people are getting involved in the government. It becomes official when, after Congress agrees to the 19th Amendment, three-quarters of the state legislatures also agree to it. They will ratify this amendment, and in 1920, the 19th Amendment is added to the Constitution, officially granting women the right to vote. And if you recall, one of the goals of the progressives was to improve the government and get more people involved. And that's what the 19th Amendment does. More people are involved with watching over the government, taking away uh, power from the political machines, and trying to create that more honest government. Women's suffrage now becomes a basic law in the United States. And what you see right here are women from the National Women's Party, Alice Paul's party, sewing flags or sewing stars onto their flag. Every time one of the states ratified the 19th Amendment, they would sew another star on until they had the required number to officially gain the right to vote. 